morning, everybody, and welcome. Hi, Florentine. How's it going? It's good to see you. Good to see you. So, so we're, we're letting everybody in right now. So we've got everyone's trying to get into the room. And I think we're going to have a, an introduction. We've got one of our affiliates in action is going to be kicking us off this morning. So I don't know if is Joanna on the call yet. It doesn't look like she's here. I think we've got an affiliates in action that's going to be kicking us off. I don't see Joanna yet. Hi. That's okay. It's I don't think Joanna's coming on the call today. She wasn't sure if she'd be able to make it. Okay. Um, but I'm here to introduce you whenever you're ready. So I guess Wonderful. we'll wait. We'll wait for the affiliate in action. Uh, do you know who that is or? Yeah, I I can I can look it up right now. Let's see. Uh -huh. I should know these things. Yes, it is going to be. Ah, I just see we're going to have one of our affiliates in action do the introduction. Crystal, I know you're on the line. Do you do you um, know who the affiliate was who wanted to um, wanted to kick us off this morning? Maybe it's Mindy. Mindy, hi. Uh, it wasn't. It was a name I wasn't familiar with yet. It was somebody that I hadn't. Um, it wasn't me. I haven't I'm yet. Sorry. Yeah, it was somebody I haven't yet met. Crystal, do you have the? Um, I see Crystal Jensen's on the line with us. Crystal, do you have that email um, from yeah, Joanna? I think it probably is Mindy. Her name is Melinda Flynn. Melinda Flynn. Uh, no, I'm Melinda. Yeah, but I'm oh, not a really okay. in action. <laughs> Oh, okay. So I'm just here to introduce you. Um, but if we do, if we do have an affiliate that comes on that was going to do a little, uh, you know, a little uh, talk, then we'll let them jump in when they come on the call. Awesome. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you, Melinda. I don't think we've met yet. No, huh? I'm excited <laughs> that you're here. Thank you for coming on the call. Of course. Um, Thank you. So, um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It's a little after 10. And um, for those of you that have not um, met Florentine, this is Florentine Christian, and she's a certified ADU specialist. Uh, she combines her professional leadership experience in the fields of real estate, construction, and property management in her endeavor to tackle California's housing crisis one sidekick at a time. As a certified ADU specialist, she returns to her construction roots where she began working with the family construction business at age 14. By age 18, she had experience in all aspects of residential home building from foundations to final finishes. And the greatest values that she learned from her father- Look how bad Mike looks. What's that? I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, um, the greatest values that she learned from her father were integrity, always treat customers fairly, work ethic, never sit down on the job. I guess that wouldn't get you too far in, <laughs> in construction, right? <laughs> um, foresight, grab the other end of that board or more like apprehend, you need to grab the other end of the board before dad has to ask. <laughs> That's right. Florentine, Florentine holds a master's degree in organizational systems with certificate in building a sustainable world from Saybrook University. When she's not helping homeowners with their ADU projects, she enjoys planning or playing urban farmer in our backyard garden with her four legged compa companions, Zuri and Mr. or Meister. Mr. Mister. Oh, mm -hmm. Cute. Well, it sounds like you have a really well-rounded background and um, we're really excited to have you here. Where, um, where was your construction? I mean, is it all over the South Bay or? It was actually in Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay. So yeah, as a child, that's where I grew up, was up in Portland. So oh, nice. uh -huh. yeah, but boy. How long have you been here in the Southern California area? Um, over 10 years now. 
How nice. So yeah, been here, been here for some time. Yeah. Well, we're excited to hear from you. Um, do you have a, are you going to screen share or? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got, I'm able to, to control all of that on my end. So okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, I have a dishwasher being installed. So when the guys come, I'll probably have to pop off. So not a problem. That Mike is not a problem at all. If you need something, right, Mike? Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Glad you're here. Glad you're here, Mike Harper. Um, I've got a lot of a lot of friends on the on the line here and many realtors who I know have already called us out to help them with um, seen a lot of very familiar faces on our call today. Um, a lot of realtors on the call have already called us out and utilized our services and um, had us help homeowners and, you know, help in transactions when they had a property with an ADU or um, a buyer wanting to buy a property with potential to build an ADU. So great to see so many um, friends and familiar faces on the call. Um, we've got a lot to lot to cover with you guys today. Um, so I'm going to be as, as poignant as I can, really try and get to the point and see if we can have a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A, because um, I know there's probably going to be quite a bit of that. Um, so let's just go ahead and uh, dive right in here. I am going to share my screen with you. All right. Okay, we're gonna make this a little bit bigger. Can you guys all see my, my screen here? Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, today's presentation presented by Sidekick Homes. Who are we? Um, we basically were founded with a mission to help families, local communities overcome the housing crisis by developing new housing units and neighborhood backyards. We call them sidekicks. Um, and then beyond just being a new home developer, we do uh, provide design and um, construction services. But in addition, we really are a full service team and we also educate our clients every step of the way. Um, so oftentimes homeowners really wanna be involved and understand what's going on. All right, so I'm gonna be presenting the, the presentation. Melinda already gave a, a pretty lengthy bio there. <laughs> Thank you, Melinda. Um, and so I am the founder and CEO of Sidekick Homes. Um, really quick, I, I know we've covered this before, what is an ADU, but it's really important to cover this because everything we're going to be talking about today is a special class of home building that, allow, that has all kinds of leniencies that will come along with it. So there are a lot of things in the state law that apply to accessory dwelling units that don't apply to other types of additional units or accessory structures. Um, and oftentimes we get calls on um, to, to advise on things that are not accessory dwelling units. So it's really important that we really understand what the definition is. Basically right here under um, number three, accessory dwelling units need to have four things, okay? They need to have their own kitchen, their own bathroom, their own sleeping quarters and a separate entrance. So if they don't have one of those things, they are not an accessory dwelling in it. We might be able to convert it to an accessory dwelling in it, but it's not an accessory dwelling in it. And it won't qualify for all of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, the other thing is an accessory, this is the definition based on our inner California um, government code, right? So you'll also notice that they're a valuable form of housing. So they're not a valuable form of short-term rental, such as Airbnb. They're a valuable form of housing. And so that's just really important to really understand that the state is requiring local governments and municipalities to um, allow homeowners to do things that otherwise the local zoning would not allow for. And that is because we have such a housing crisis. So they're doing this to create housing, not necessarily to create home offices or to create Airbnb rental income, et cetera. So just something to keep in mind, um, ADUs, you know, if you're trying to build it for those other purposes, I mean, no one's gonna come in and check and see how you're, how you're utilizing it per se, but it's gonna have to have all of these things that a dwelling unit would have, because that's what the point of all of this law is. That's just a little contextual background. Um, sometimes people ask us the different forms. Obviously you can have ADUs come in all different forms. So sometimes people just see a prefab ADU company and they think, oh, that's what an ADU is. An ADU could be a number of things. It can be, it can be a new detached structure. It can be built within the existing main home. It can be built within a converted garage or, or a converted barn. 
right? An, um, an accessory structure to the main house can be converted to an ADU. It can be attached to the primary residence. It can also be built from within the existing space. So if somebody had a two-story house and they wanted to convert one of those levels to an ADU, that's a possibility. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today? I've given a number of presentations for, for um, PVPAR and I'm not gonna go through past content that we've gone through. Um, we are recapping like the 2020 legal updates. There was a ton of param new parameters around what can be built regards to ADUs. We're putting all of that on our website in a special page for realtors only. So you'll be able to go back and look at all of that information if you, if you have, you know, if this is your first time learning about ADUs, we will have all of that in a resources section on our website, but we're not going to go through it today because a lot of you guys have already sat through that content. Um, it's time to talk about what's new in terms of ADUs. So what we're going to talk about today is what are the 2021 California legislative updates? Um, they're much fewer than they were last year. What's going on with the local ADU ordinances? We're gonna specifically talk about the four, um, the four cities on the peninsula. Um, what are the best practices when you're working with a buyer when it comes to ADUs that maybe they're wanting to buy a property with ADU potential? Um, what to consider around unpermitted units and what happens when you get a violation from the city? What are some options for that? Um, we are seeing more and more that cities are giving um, violations for unpermitted units. So how do you deal with that? And then best practices for listings with your ADUs. Um, there, we, we are having some challenges, especially with appraisals when it comes to ADUs, just because appraisals are geared towards looking historically and ADUs are you know, relatively new animals. So what should you do to be prepared for that appraisal so that you get a fair appraisal on your, on your listing? Um, and then our ADU resources for realtors. We're gonna wrap with that. All right, so first of all, let's look at the regulatory landscape. So one thing that I like for people to, to understand is when it comes to what a person can build on their lot, there are a number of different things that we're looking at. So we're looking at what are the, what are, what are the state mandates? What do the city's local ordinances look like? Usually that's local planning department. Um, what is the zoning and land use requirements for that area? How does that pertain to the local ADU ordinance? What are the state building codes, local building codes, um, fire and safety requirements, the state fire marshal gets to weigh in, um, utilities and easements. Um, what are the utility companies wanting to say about um, building an ADU on a, on a specific property? How is the property going to be used? Again, is it going to be used for rental property? Is a um, a family member going to live there. Um, if you're wanting to do Airbnb, what does the local city say about that? Um, a couple of other regulatory bodies would be Coastal Commission. That's a really big one that we run into um, and that will, will affect a lot of the clients that you guys are, are working with. Um, so you guys don't have to know all of this. I just like for you to understand the complexity because a lot of times I'll get a phone call and someone will say, hey, we got a property in the city of Torrance. What can we do on that property? It's like, well, it depends. It depends on where is that property located and which of these different um, regulatory bodies are going to want to have a say so on what can be built on that property. So you don't have to know all of this. It's it's you know this is what makes us ADU experts is we're paying attention to all of that. But I want to highlight for you some of the changes that are new. So for those of you who have been ADU savvy and you've been keeping up with the latest, here are some new things um, for you to be on the lookout for. So first of all, um, there was a, um, an assembly bill that was passed, 3182, that changed some things for accessory dwelling units. And one of the things they changed was as it relates to homeowners association. So um, basically, HOAs must allow ADUs to be built on separate, separate interest properties. So what is a separate interest property? What that is, is um, so if, you if you're in a... Um, an HOA that's all condos and they're all attached buildings, that's not a separate interest property. A separate interest property would be a standalone property, a single family property um, where the homeowner has a separate interest in that specific property. Okay. Um, and HOAs, as of January of this year, they cannot restrict a homeowner from renting out an ADU. 
um, as long as it's a long-term rental. They can, however, restrict short-term rentals. Okay, so this is really important. And I know some of our cities on the peninsula are within essentially a, a homeowners association of their own. So this does affect some of our, our cities on the peninsula. Okay, the other thing that AB 3182 did, this is a little bit of a cleanup um, thing. And, and so it's, it's previously what the state law said was for any city that does not have an ADU ordinance, when they get an application for an ADU ordinance, they must respond to that with an approval or a denial or however they're going to respond within 60 days. Um, or it's deemed permitted and they can go ahead and start building. Um, that language was not in place for cities that have an ADU ordinance. So this basically cleaned the, the law up to reflect the intention which is that cities that have an ordinance or don't have an ordinance um, need to approve plans within 60 days or um, it's deemed permitted. Now, that's what the law says. Let me tell you what's going on in, practical in practicality. In practicality, after all of these laws went into place, COVID hit and we have got, um, you know, all of our local planning departments, they're all working in alternative ways, right? Because people are working from home. The processes are just taking a little bit longer. So this is something that, yes, technically, this is what the state law says. Um, however, we don't have a lot of backing from our legal partners, from our um, attorneys and the you know um, State Department of Housing and Community Development. A lot of our connections that would normally back us up when we because we do frequently find cities aren't complying with the state requirements, not because they're trying to be a pickle, but just because um, there are a lot of complexities that sometimes they misinterpret, right? So we regularly, um, you know, are, are informing some of the local agencies about what they need to be allowing homeowners to do when they take actions that they're not supposed to. Um, when it comes to the, and we have pretty good backup from, again, from HCD and also from some of our attorney partners, but when it comes to the 60 day approval, no one's really wanting to tackle, no one's really wanting to enforce that right now, just because of COVID. So I just want to throw that caveat, caveat out there from a practical standpoint. So a lot of times people say, hey, it's been 60 days, can I just start building? And it's like, well, you could. And the city is going to probably have something to say about that. And you're going to be in a legal battle. And do you want to take on, is that a battle you really want to take on? Or are you willing to just wait? Most of our clients, we're just waiting um, and letting the city go through the process that they have to go through. All right. So here we go. Um, the other thing that AB 3182 did, again, this was a slight cleanup in the bill. There was a portion of the ADU um, law that says that within an existing structure, you can build an ADU or a junior ADU. So previously, a person could build an ADU and a junior ADU if the ADU was a separate detached structure, but you couldn't do an ADU and a junior ADU within the same existing structure. That language has been cleaned up by the change of, they changed the wording from or to and <laughs> in the state government code. So now you can build both within an existing structure. So minor change, but a big deal for clients who maybe that's what they were trying to do. We don't usually encourage junior ADUs, um, just so you guys know, and if, if anyone wants to get into discussion about what's a junior ADU, we can talk about that a little bit later, but. Junior ADUs basically, um, they do have to be built within the existing structure. They will require that a, um, a deed restriction be placed on title, stating that the property must be owner occupied. And so when, you, when your client goes to sell their property, the new homeowner is going to have to accept that covenant because it's on title, it runs with the land now. Um, saying that it's that they're going to own or occupy the property or they'll have to remove the junior ADU. So it, I don't think that junior ADUs are a great solution for most people, but 
in a few situations, they work probably nine times out of 10. It's, it's probably not something that a person's going to want to endeavor. Um, and it's, it's also important um, to, to be on a lookout because, you know, for example, we have submitted plans to a city um, and in their covenant, we were submitting plans for an ADU in their covenant restriction, they wrote it up like a junior ADU, which would have required the owner occupancy. And obviously we, we said, no, this has to be changed. And it went back to the city attorney and they took that language out. But this is where it's just really important. You know, probably an average designer would have just said, oh, you want, sure, you know, we need to have this form signed here, client, you need to sign this form amidst a stack of paperwork to get your ADU approved. And now unbeknownst to the homeowner, they've just tied themselves down and probably tied their hands a bit when it comes time to sell because they're gonna have to find a buyer who either will remove it or um, will you know, um, say that they're gonna live there. And then that affects their, their loan, their lending, right? Because if someone's trying to buy it as a second property, the lender is not gonna wanna see that on title. So it just, it creates, it creates some, it does create some challenges. Um, so just, just to, that's ADU, junior ADU. Again, we don't recommend a, junior ADUs for, for, for this, for this exact reason, but, um, we're happy to, to, you know, answer more questions about junior ADUs if people have them. You got to be careful that there's a lot of people out teaching these ADU classes and are like, oh, you can turn a single family property into a triplex now. And this is what they're talking about. They're talking about the ADU, junior ADU, but they're not telling people what the negative consequences are of doing that. So, you know, it's, it's not the case that you can just turn every single family into a triplex. That's not the reality right now. And, and ADUs don't count towards the zoning density, right? So if you have a single family and you add an ADU, you don't now have a duplex. You have a single family with an ADU. So, all right. So what's up next? Next, let's talk about um, an assembly bill that did, that passed, it passed the assembly and the Senate, but it was vetoed by the governor. So it did not go into place, but I do want to talk to you guys about it because I feel like this is something that you're likely going to see on the horizon. One of the big challenges with ADUs um, for homeowners is oftentimes financing. They may not have enough equity in their house to get a home equity loan. Um, and then with interest rates really low, they may not necessarily want to get that construction loan that's going to be a higher interest rate. So what are what are we able to do? So this is what AB 96 would have done um, had, had the governor not um, yeah. vetoed it. All right, somebody's answered their oh, phone, but I'm going to ask you to mute. Hold on, let me see. We got it. We got to. Yeah, you know, all of I've got to let me jump in and mute somebody here. I was shocked. I wanted You'll to go. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Who do we have? All right. I should have set somebody else up to be my co-moderator here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I am not able to to get it looks to me like everyone's muted. I'm not seeing who's un, who's unmuted right You're now. Talking about Orange County? Looks like it's Yoko. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. Yoko. Yeah. All right. There we go. We got her muted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Sounds like Yoko's getting a new deal. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so this is what AB 69 would have done. Um, again, it, it was passed by the Assembly and Senate, not by the governor. The governor vetoed it. It would have addressed a gap in the marketplace to allow existing mortgage lenders to offer bridge loans um, that would have been, it would have been a state backed lending mechanism. So the state would have provided a guarantee on these, um, on these lending mechanisms that would encourage banks, credit unions, and other mortgage originators um, to be able to make construction loans to homeowners to bridge to existing federally backed loans. Um, and the big reason why this was vetoed was somebody on the, um, the governor's finance team thought that this might affect the credit rating, um, the state's credit rating, if we were to back this. He felt like it was too big of a risk, and that's why it didn't go through. But this is still very much being looked at in terms of how do we create additional financing, and I have a feeling that something very similar will likely um, be proposed again. It had a lot of support, um, again, from our legislature. Um, and it would have established something called the Help Homeowners Add New Housing Account to the California Housing Financing Fund. Again, it did not go into place, but maybe next year we'll be looking at um, something that will provide support for financing ADUs. All right, 
Um, let's talk for a minute about utility easements and encroachments. So this is not necessarily a state law thing. This is what's happening locally, but it is something that's changed um, fairly recently. So previously, a lot of properties had issues with building because they had utility easements on them or they had power poles in close proximity to where they were wanting to build an ADU. Um, what we're start what we're seeing now is that LADWP and SoCal Edison are now allowing some ADUs to be built um, within utility easements and near power poles. It's becoming a more a much more streamlined process. So if there are properties that in the past maybe couldn't build an ADU because they had a, a big power pole right behind the garage that they wanted to convert to an ADU, for an example, um, they they now are allowing most of those. Um, it will require an encroachment process, which adds time to the permitting. It adds about three to four months. So what we do is when we first get into contract with a client, um, even while we're working on putting together the floor plan and drawing up the plans, we've already submitted that encroachment application to get that underway so that that doesn't become an additional thing that's going to um, take extra time to get a, a um, ADU project approved. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, and LADWP is no longer charging for that encroachment. So it was close to about $7,000 to get that encroachment. Um, and it's now, um, there's no cost, which is fantastic. And it was taking about six to eight months. So definitely we've seen a huge improvement when it comes to um, being able to work around utility easements. All right, let's look at our local ordinance. I want to give you guys a little bit of an update. Um, let me just check the um, check the chat really quick. I do have a couple of ADU specialists on here that are going to help field some of the questions. Um, and I may have, um, Allison, I don't know if you're going to be able to be here, Allison or Crystal, if you'll be here with us for the whole presentation or not. But if you want to, if you're seeing a, a um, a question that you feel like is one that we should answer in time with the presentation, pre please feel free to let me know um, and we can make sure that we get those um, those addressed. All right, so let's talk about local um, our local ordinance updates. Um, so I'm going to just give you guys a, um, a bit of an overview here so that you know what's going on on the peninsula when it comes to ADUs. So first of all, um, Palos Verdes Estates um, last year permitted four ADUs. So probably one of the biggest calls I get related to PVE is, are they are they approving permits? Are they going to approve my ADU? Um, and um, last year, four out of the five applications that were submitted uh, were approved. And one of them was not approved based on a technicality. So they are being approved in, in Palos Verdes Estates. Um, you know, those... Don't be, a, don't be afraid of what you're hearing if you're sitting in on the local city council meetings or the planning commission meetings. The bottom line is, is that the state law does require cities to allow ADUs within certain parameters um, and the city is, they're complying with that. They are, they are permitting ADUs. Um, they did adopt an urgency ordinance in April of last year. It is set to expire in April of this year. So we're anticipating seeing a more permanent ordinance in place from uh, Palos Verdes Estates within the coming months. Um, Rancho Palos Verdes permitted seven ADUs last year, and they just updated their ADU ordinance in January. Um, so that's brand new. Um, Rolling Hills, we have not been able to get information for them about how many ADUs were permitted last year, but we do know that they adopted their ordinance in May of 2020. Um, and Rolling Hills Estates has permitted three AD, ADUs in 2020. Um, they updated their ADU ordinance in March. The planner there is fantastic. She's very knowledgeable. She's actually um, applying for, uh, she has applied and received grant resources on um, some programs that will actually help homeowners in the area when it comes to ADUs and just in terms of understanding what they're able to build and whatnot. So she's been very, pro been, um, very knowledgeable. She, I'll, I'll just say she's knowledgeable and on top of things um, and, and a wonderful resource. So that's what's going on. Now, if you have specific questions about what's in those ordinances, what all of the details are, I could do a whole, whole entire day long class to go deep on 
all of the details that are in these ordinances, um, which we don't we don't have time for today. But if you have specific questions, um, let me know. We are able to um, we are able to go out and research a property and tell you exactly what can be built. We're currently we currently do have a project um, in Rancho Palos Verde, so we're currently working with the planning department there, um, and we have. Um, we have projects in other South Bay areas as well. So we've got three ADUs currently in process with um, Redondo Beach. We've got one almost completed construction in Hermosa Beach um, and one that we're getting started with in uh, Manhattan Beach coastal zone. So we're, we're, you know, have projects going on through, uh, you know, throughout the beach cities as well. All right, um, we're going to skip through these. If we have time, we can come back. This was just a little bit about what's the ADU design build process. You guys have seen a lot of this. What is it? How much time is it taking? What are the steps to go through? Um, who are the team members that a person will need to have if they're going to build an ADU? A lot of times, people think, "Oh, I'm going to call a contractor," which that's one of your <laughs> that's one of your team members. But you really need to put a team together that's going to work very well together. Um, that's what will ultimately provide savings in terms of time and cost on your ADU project. All right, but let's get into you. Let's talk about you and um, how we can help you with your buyers and sellers um, when it comes to ADUs. And this is based on what are the things that have come up the most in the past year that I feel like are really important for, for realtors to know. Um, these are just some kind of best practices from all the lessons learned over the previous year. So first of all, when it comes to finding the right property, your client, let's say they, they either want to find a property with an ADU or they want to find a property where they could build an ADU. What should you be looking for as a realtor, right? So let's talk about that. We're going to talk about what to look for and what are the things that you, that you want to steer clear of. All right. So, so first of all, you want to think about accessibility. Right. First of all, accessibility for how it how is it um, another household going to be entering or leaving this property. Right. Um, and also, how are we going to get construction equipment and vehicles back to the build site? Because that will affect the cost of the build. So so things that are advantageous are properties that are on corner lots, properties with alley access or at, at minimum, a property with a driveway so that we can you know, get a truck back there with all of the building equipment. Now, if a property doesn't have these things, we probably can still build an ADU, right? It's just going to take more manpower to tr take everything back by hand, right? And if it's taking things back by hand up a hillside, um, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be some additional costs involved there. So these are things to look for in terms of good candidate for a property where you want to build an ADU. Flat buildable lots. So Properties that are on a on a hillside or have a steep grading can come with um, pretty substantial costs. Public sewer. So I, I know that there are different areas on the peninsula that are on septic. Um, so that's just something to be aware of that there are going to be additional requirements, potentially different costs. Um, you know, we're going to have to avoid the 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 drainage field, there's things that, that are just going to be extra considerations when you're on a um, property that has um, septic. All right. Um, a property that has a detached structure that's in good condition, such as a garage or a barn, um, that we could convert. Because now all of a sudden, if the building itself is there and it's in good condition, um, it could save some costs on the build of an ADU. And then a house that is easily dividable, right? Like some of the tall and skinnies in Redondo Beach, for example, might be great candidates for building an, an accessory dwelling in it. Um, areas where the rents are high, obviously, this is where a client will, you know, the numbers will really make sense. I will just say though, pretty much anywhere in LA County, the numbers make, the numbers make sense to build an ADU. Usually uh, people pay, they usually will pay for themselves within three to eight years. Usually it's about five to seven, but kind of a range within about three to eight years that will pay for itself, whether the homeowner is renting it out or they're having a family member live there who all who is then not paying market rent somewhere else. So it typically pays for itself very, very quickly. Um, and then 
as a homeowner is looking for a place that where they might be able to build an ADU, you want to think about how are they planning to use it and are they wanting the yard space to be communal or private. So, for example, if somebody wants a family member to live there, if they want their 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 mother in law to live on on the property, um, then they they prob they may want more of a communal backyard because they're probably going to be sharing backyard space, or maybe not. Maybe you really want privacy from your mother in law. I don't know. Maybe you want to want really high fence, big shrubs. I don't know. Um, but how you're going to use the space will probably also be indicative when you're looking for a property that might be a good place for someone to want to build their ADU. If you now when you're working with your buyer, what are the properties you should avoid? There are some that we, we do not recommend. If you're looking for a property and you've got choices, um, these are probably not the best choices for ADU because they will add a lot of time and cost to the project. So one is properties that are in a coastal overlay zone. Um, they may or may not require a coastal development permit. If it is a multifamily property, in a um, coastal overlay zone, it, it most likely will require a coastal development permit. Uh, if you're wanting to build, if it's single family, especially if it's um, you know, within an existing, it probably won't, uh, but we can, we can determine that for you. Um, additional coastal restrictions may apply. The, the um, state law pretty much says that the um, the Coastal Development Act of uh, 1976 basically trumps the the um, the California government code related to ADUs. So there may be additional restrictions in a coastal area. The CDP process will require substantially a longer plan check process. The processing the process costs will be higher, and we may have to do a public hearing uh, for the ADU. So it's a lot more upfront cost to maybe be able to build your ADU or maybe not. And so that has some people not wanting to invest the money for a maybe. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're buying the property with an intention to build an ADU, that's something that I would recommend probably steering clear of. Um, the other thing is if you're buying a property in a combined hillside and high fire hazard zone, um, the state law does require for different requirements to be built. And so we've already seen like um, Rancho Palos Verdes in their ordinance that's related to high fire zone. They're basically basing it on does a property have two streets that they can exit out of a community to get into a main um, to get onto a main street. And if you don't have two um, exit points, then you may not be able to build an ADU on that property. So it's getting a little bit more complex, right? When you're in an area that's that's deemed high fire area, high fire hazard and hillside. Now all of a sudden there's there's additional requirements we have to look at to determine if you can build an ADU on the property or not. Um, similarly, I know um, with um, Palos Verdes Estates as they've been taught, you know, they're in talks about what they want their ordinance to look look like, but they are looking at at restricting. ADUs from being built in certain areas because they are hillside and high fire. So they're trying to limit density in those areas. So that's just something to pay attention to because there are a lot of these areas um, on the peninsula. Um, so it's not available to show until Saturday, maybe Sunday. Okay, we've got somebody else that took their phone off of mute. Let's see who it is. Let's see if we can get uh, when I put it on the market. So all right, there we go. Okay, um, so let's see. And then the other thing that you really want to avoid is lots that have steep grading um, or on a hillside because oftentimes what will happen is the planning department will require a soils report, um, which will be about five to $8,000. They'll also require a topographical survey, which is gonna probably be another $4,000. Um, and then we don't know how what type of a foundation system we're going to have to put into that ADU until we get um, until we get that information back from the soils engineer. So what that could mean is the the additional cost for the foundation over a standard property could be twenty thousand dollars more, fifty thousand dollars more, a hundred thousand dollars more. How it, it's going to depend on how deep that foundation has to be. A lot of times when they are doing the soils report, they have to bore down until they hit bedrock. 
And so if depending on how deep it is to get hit that bedrock, that's how deep your foundation might have to be. Um, in a lot of coastal areas, we might have to be looking at piers and caissons, so which get very, very costly. So um, that's just something to, to definitely um, be aware of. And a lot of homeowners just aren't willing, you know, we've consulted on projects like this and the homeowner really wants a, a good ballpark idea of what is this project going to cost before they get plans underway. And we have to tell them, well, there's a pretty um, broad spectrum of what that can cost. And we won't be, really be able to give you a ballpark until you spend, you know, eight to $12,000 to for us to find out what's there to know what to build. So, so sometimes in those areas, it's, you know, if you're trying to put an offer on a property and someone's trying to see if the numbers pencil out, it's, it's going to be really hard to get good numbers. So we, we just recommend uh, probably not a good choice of property. There's plenty of other properties out there. Move on to the next. All right, let's talk about bootleg units. Um, we get, we get a lot of calls on these. These are fun. Okay. So we're wearing our hat of representing the buyer right now. We'll talk about from the, when you're the listing agent in a minute and how do you how do you handle bootleg units in a minute? But but when you're when you're representing the buyer, you guys probably already know this, but the unpermitted units are not going to receive value in an appraisal. So when your client's putting in an offer, you kind of have to treat that that bootleg as it's not going to have value, right? Um, permitting is going to require that the unit be brought up to the current building code. Right, so um, a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna buy this property and then I'll just get it permitted and I'm just gonna go down to the city and pay a couple hundred bucks and get a permit on my property. And that's just not the case. The reality is, is what we're seeing is typically the cost to get a unit permitted is usually gonna cost at minimum about 40 to $50,000. And it could potentially, the cost could potentially be as high as rebuilding the whole thing entirely. And so we just really like people to know that going in, if you have a client who's intending to get something permitted, they're, they're walking into a lot of unknowns. Now we can come out and try to point out what some of those things might be. Um, these are the common things that, that we see that the cities are requiring. Number one, they may require um, upgraded utility meters and supply lines. You might have to put a bigger plumbing main line on the house, right? You may have to, um, upgrade your, you may have to upgrade your meter. You may have, you will have to have a separate um, panel. Um, even things like on a lot of these unpermitted units, for example, we'll see the, the sewer ties into the back of the home, but code requires that, that, that there be a Y off of the main sewer line before it enters the main house. So that, that means that the sewer line has to go all the way around, typically to the front of the property, unless your sewer line runs at the back of the property. So a lot of times, like the homeowner doesn't realize this, but you know, there's this whole additional cost because we have to redo the whole entire sewer line and trench that to the front of the property. Um, typically the foundation is going to need to be underpinned. If it was something like a previously a garage or something like that, usually we're going to have to underpin the foundation. A lot of times the windows don't meet code. They don't meet energy code um, or they're not, they're too, they're too high. They don't meet egress um, requirements. Um, electrical, plumbing, and mechanical may not be up to code. Um, almost always, there's usually not a moisture barrier between the, you know, if it was built, you know, slab on grade, and then they put flooring, there, there needs to be a moisture barrier between, um, usually we're not finding that. So they may have gorgeous new flooring in there, but we're going to have to take all that flooring up anyway, because we have to put a moisture barrier down. So um, they're, they're really, you might walk into a unit and be like, wow, this looks beautiful, it looks gorgeous. You know, we're, we're just going to get it permitted. Well, just because just it's gorgeous, we, we may still have to be removing the flooring, removing the drywall, changing out the insulation. I mean, it really may, it may end up requiring a lot of cost. So that's just something to consider when your buyer is looking to purchase a, a bootleg unit and thinking they're going to get it permitted. Typically the costs are, are more significant than what, um, than what a, a buyer knows. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. All right, now what about, we've been getting a lot of these this year, what about when you have an unpermitted unit and your client receives a violation? And I think there's at least two or three people on this call right now that, that we've helped with this specific situation. All right, so um, there is new code that went into place January of last year 
that basically allows for a five year delay in enforcement of an unpermitted ADU to give the homeowner an opportunity to get it permitted. And this code is only in place until 2030. So what the idea is, is the state realizes that there are a lot of units that are not permitted and they're trying to give people time to get them permitted. That's what this is. This is a little bit of a, it's not quite an amnesty because they're not saying you can just keep it, but they are allowing time for people to get these, uh, um, to get them, um, permitted. Now, here's why this is helpful. Again, you just saw on the previous slide, it can be really, really costly to upgrade that unit, right? So um, if a homeowner gets a violation, they may not have time right away to, to get that cleaned up. They may not have money to get it cleaned up. We're seeing cities like um, Lomita and Compton, where when it's part of the transaction that the city goes through and does an inspection, and if there's anything unpermitted, they require you to either take it back to the original or get it permitted within 30 days, 45 days, whatever it is. All of a sudden, these home, you know, someone purchases a property, they have very, very short period of time to quick get everything permitted and up to code, and it could be a significant cost. So this get this buys people time, is what it does. So you may be able to get this five-year delay in enforcement, is what it's it will still be delayed. It just gives you five years. Um, if the ADU was built before January 1st, 2020, why is that important? It's important because the, the state's saying, look, we've made it really lenient and really easy to build an ADU and permit an ADU. Um, so anything that was done before that, we're gonna, we're gonna help you to get it permitted. But from, from January 1st on, you kind of have no excuse to do a, an unpermitted unit. You really need to be doing it the permitted way because we've given you every leniency in the world to do so. So that's why this date is important. Um, if it was built after January 1st in a city where the local agency had a non-compliant ordinance, then there's a possibility that you could um, also get this delay. So this is why this is why it's important for cities to have a complying ordinance. If they if they're not complying, all of a sudden they may a city may have a bigger burden when it comes to unpermitted units that are being built. Okay, now the local agency is required to grant the extension so long as cor correcting the violation is not necessary to protect health and safety. So what that means is. It's okay if the unpermitted unit is not up to building code, so long as it's it's a habitable space, it's not going to be a, a hazard to somebody living there. All right. Now, this is what the code says. However, what percentage of cities do you think are aware that this code even exists? Does anyone have any ideas? Anyone want to unmute themselves and give us a roundabout um, idea of all the cities that we've worked with, what percentage of them you think are, are aware that this, this exists and that they're required to give a five-year extension? Anybody, anyone have a guess? Everyone's muted. Hi, all right. Hi. None, my guess is none. All right, I heard none, what else? 10%. 10%, okay, any other guesses? All right, it looks like Shelly was right. We have not found a city yet that even knows that this exists. Um, not only that, but when they give the violation, they're supposed to have verbiage on the violation that tells the homeowner how they can file for an extension. And we haven't seen that on a single violation that anyone's received. So this just means the cities are not aware of this right now. So your homeowner probably is, is you know, might be facing a little bit of a, of a challenge trying to get this implemented. So this is like a little known, um, it's a little known workaround. Um, and and it, here's, here's where it's beneficial. It's beneficial for, um, and we've had this a couple times very, very recently where the listing agent has called and said, we want to get this property sold, but it's got a violation for an unpermitted unit. Um, but we want to sell sooner rather than later. We don't want to incur a lot of time or um, undue expense, right? What can we do, right? So they're calling us like, can you hurry? Can you get this permitted for us? Can you, you know, and we're saying, whoa, 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 it's going to, it's going to take months. 
This is going to take months to get plans drawn, submitted to the city, have an inspector come out, do all of the repairs that are likely going to be needed. And I mean, you guys, hey, if you've got someone hot to sell, you want them to sell now, right? The market's hot now. We don't know what the market's going to do six months from now, nine months from now. If someone's ready to sell, let's get that, let's get that house sold while the market's hot, right? Um, and so this can really, really save you if you're trying to list a property um, that potentially has a violation. It's a lot easier to just get an extension than to have to go through months and months trying to get a unit permitted. So this hopefully, this hopefully, this one little tip hopefully made this whole entire um, webinar worthwhile for you guys. All right, do we have any questions up until now? We're going to be um, switching gears here in just a minute and be talking about the listing side of things, but I've covered a lot so far and I just want to see if there are any questions or if there are anything's come up in the chat box or if anyone just wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment. Looks like something did come up in the chat box. Will the extension pass to the new owner? Yes. So the extension is not related to the person. It's related to the property. So yes, the extension will pass to a new homeowner. So if you were to sell a house that had a violation and had five years to remedy, um, then yes, the, the new homeowner would still have um, that period of time to get it remedied. So that would be um, a really smart thing to disclose to the potential buyer. All right. What else? Any other questions? All right. If none, then we will keep trekking. We'll keep trekking on this call. All right, we're making great time. Okay. Um, so let's see here. If we go back to, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen with you again. Um, here we go. Somebody's phone is ringing. We can have you mute your phone. That'd be great. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to um, our next topic. So ADU site consultation and property evaluation. When does it make sense to have us come out and do a consultation for your client? And what are the costs to do that? Um, so the, the three times that it makes the most sense for you is um, if you have a client looking at properties and you've opened an escrow, you've opened escrow on a property and you think that this property might have good ADU potential, call us out and we will do a consultation for you, right? Um, normally our consultations are $300, but we give a discount if it's a real, if it's your client, right? If it's for you or if it's for your client, we will do that for $250. Um, so we wanna definitely wanna take care of your clients. What I will say is it usually takes us about a week to get all of the research compiled to do these reports. We do understand, though, that when you guys are in escrow, your time is truncated. And we've had it um, where uh, um, a client has wanted, um, they want to know if they can build an ADU before they even start paying for other inspections, right? So they need us out ASAP. A week is too long. So we try to get, if we know that you're in escrow, we are going to try to get you in sooner rather than later. So that's really important if you or if your client call us make sure to, to let us know that you're in escrow on a property and we will do everything we can to get you scheduled as quickly as we can. The way you can help us is um, by getting it. Sometimes people will text me and say, hey, Florentine, we're in escrow. We need help. We need this ADU done quick. And I hustle my team and say, can we move the schedule around? Can we get this person in quick? Yes, we can. But then what we need for you to do is actually go through the process and get it scheduled and paid for. And that's what actually creates the deal sheet for us to start researching your property. So a lot of times people are texting me and I say, yeah, we can fit you in, but we've got to get it set up ASAP. And then our team can't get in touch with anyone to get it actually scheduled and paid for. And then our, you know, we don't, we start losing time to research. So we're willing to help you out and squeeze you into the schedule, but help us out too. And just 
um, you know, make sure that we have the information that we need so that we can get started with getting it researched. That's all I will say. And I know you guys are super busy. When you open escrow, there's so many different things that you're trying to coordinate. I know that. I know you're busy, but help help us help you. Um, that would be my one big piece of feedback. Help us help you um, so that we can get the ball rolling on your behalf. Um, if you want to order a site consultation, um, I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. Okay. When you're the listing agent on a property that you think has good ADU potential, or if it does have that unpermitted ADU on it, um, it may be good to have an ADU report done. But if it has a permitted ADU, you, you don't really need us to do anything for you. It's, it's permitted, you have a certificate of occupancy, it's all good. Um, but if it's not, if you have an unpermitted unit, or if you have a property you think is good ADU potential and you want to sell that as a marketing piece, um, have us come in and do a um, property report for you. And then you can put that with your supplementals on the MLS. You can include that supplemental property report. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have to be the one on the line saying, yes, it has good ADU potential. You've actually had an ADU specialist look at the property do the research and tell someone exactly what they can and can't build on the on the lot. So it does a couple things for you. First of all, it really helps with marketing when you have a report that says, yes, this property is a good candidate for an ADU. Um, but it also takes liability off of your hands from being the, the one um, putting that information out there. So, um, so there's that. And then also, if you have a client who's wanting to design or build an ADU, have us come out and do a consultation for them in advance. Um, and I, I always, our cost also goes towards our design cost. So if they end up doing the design portion with us, we credit them their $250, right? It just goes towards the cost of design. Um, but I always tell people it's better to, to, rather than just signing a design contract for several thousand dollars, why not spend a little bit up front and make sure you can build what you think you can build? Because a lot of times people can't. They have big ideas about what they want to do, and it turns out they can. You don't want to wait until you've paid to have plans drawn up and submitted to the city, only to find out you can't do what you thought you, you wanted to do, right? So we, we always tell people smart to take care of that in advance. Um, let's see, do we have a, it looks like a question might have popped up in the chat. Um, I don't see it. Um, Allison or Crystal, do either of you guys see the question that popped up? I all of a sudden can't see my chat, my group chat without sharing my screen. I have to stop sharing my screen to do that. Yeah, there was a question about the cost and turnaround for the ADE report, which you said it was 250 for the report. So they were wanting to know the turnaround time after the site visit. Perfect. So we bring the report to the site visit. So most of the research that goes into the report, we're going to be researching in advance. Um, and then there will be some site things. Now, if we need to update the report, we can do that. If there are things that we see on site that are that should be mentioned in the report, we can absolutely add those things in. All right, um, I am going to just show you really quickly. I'm just going to just take you to our website so that you can just see how quick and easy this is if you want to. Um, get in touch with us. So let me just share my screen really quick and then we'll get into listings and we'll walk through what do you need to know when you're listing a property because that's that's going to be important as well. Okay, so really quickly, this is our website at sidekick.homes. All right. Um, if you want a, a free phone consultation, you can book a phone consultation. That's really easy to do. Okay. If you are in escrow, don't book a phone consultation because let's see, when is the next phone consultation? The next phone consultation is, looks like um, might be next week. Oh, there is, there are some today. Okay, so you can book one today or, or what I say is just call us directly, right? Don't worry about all of that. Our phone number is right here. You go to the bottom of the screen right here. Here it is, 310-359-1842. Just call. Um, we... Our, one of our associates, Tafari, will likely be the person that will answer the phone. Um, and so he is sitting behind his computer. He's, he is um, very ADU knowledgeable, can answer some preliminary questions, but he's the one you want to call to get us um, scheduled to come out and do that consultation and get started with the research. It's the fastest way. If you call me, I will respond as well, but I'm usually out in the field and it may take a little bit more time for me to get back to you on the call. Um, Tafari will 
he'll either answer right away or if he's on a call, he'll get back to you within about five minutes. So that's the best way to get that consultation scheduled. Again, it's normally $300. But for if you, you know, as long as we know that you're a realtor or if your client calls and says that they're working with you, it's 250. So that's how what we want to do to make sure that we're taking care of our realtor, um, taking care of our realtor partners. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing that screen. Um, and I want to, so it says, got it, 250 for the report. So turnaround time after you visit the property. Um, again, we will have a report in hand when we come to the property. So you are gonna have the report at that time. Again, if there's anything that that's, comes up that's important when we're on site, we can add that and get that turned back around to you next day. That's not an issue, but you should have pretty much everything already in the report. All right, so let's go. Well, can I oh. ask you then, yeah. uh, so how far in advance should we order this report? Like one week in advance or how long do you need? Melinda, we usually do need a week in advance, but like I say, if you're in escrow, call us as soon as you go into escrow and we'll get yeah. you in as, as quick as we can. Um, and we'll really, we try to be flexible with your schedule. Sometimes if it's, you know, if there are tenants on the property and it's really hard to get access, mm -hmm. especially during COVID, probably it's going to make sense for us to show up the same day as the other inspections. And we know that you're trying to coordinate a lot of different schedules. So we, we really, really try to, to work with you on that. Um, even when we have a full schedule, sometimes we will move, we might even move someone, you know, we'll shift the schedule if we need to, to, to get you in, because we know, we know you're under a lot of time pressures, especially right now. It's such a seller's market um, that I know a lot of times, you know, people are putting in shorter contingency times. Um, so we really, really work to try to help you, but call us right away so that we, so that we can get that turned around. We still, we're still going to need, you know, at least a few days to, you know, to, to get the research done on a property. And you might've covered this, but um, so that, so your report is for say, there's no dwelling at all and you want to add a new dwelling. What about an existing dwelling that is not permitted? Do you also go and see what it would need to bring it up to par? Yeah, we will do, we'll do a report on that as well. Okay. Um, now, there are some things we can eyeball and, and say, well, looking at this, obviously this is gonna need to be brought up to code. There's a lot we can't see. It's either underground or it's behind walls. And typically mm -hmm. what will happen, what the process for that would be is we have to submit plans to the city mm -hmm. and then a city inspector will come out and start having us open up walls, digging down mm -hmm. to see utilities, foundation, et cetera. They basically tell us what they wanna see and we open it up and show it to them. And then they tell us what things they want to be brought up to code. So there will be some things that we already know need to be brought up to code. Other things we'll have to discover when we're midway through the process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it, you know, that's just the process. That's just the way it is. That's why with unpermitting, permitting unpermitted units, there's a bit more of an unknown in terms of what the cost is gonna be. If, yeah. we're, if we've just got nice flat land and it's, oh, what will our ADU cost? We can give you a really nice ballpark for what it'll cost. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot of decisions that the owner will make along the way um, that will affect the cost, but we can give a pretty good ballpark of costs if, it, if we're just building new. But whenever we're permitting and unpermitted, you know, and a lot of it too has to do with the city inspector, right? We've seen city inspectors allow things that even though it's not code, they're still allowing it. So it's like, okay, that was great. You know, we've had city inspectors tell us they don't want us to, to dig up the utilities. And we know the utility, the underground utilities are, you know, connected straight to the back of the house. And we know we would have to redo that. We were able to save a homeowner about $20,000 just from, from not having to do that. We've got um, a couple of contractors that are really, really good at talking to city inspectors. So, so one of our contractors, dad is a, um, a city inspector. So he's really, really good at, at having the city inspectors look at, he look at what he wants them to look at and get them on their way. And, you know, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential unknowns, but we cover those unknowns. We come out to the site and, and look at all of the potential things that, um, that might need to be updated. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions before we move on to listings? Okay. Let's talk about, um, I put a question in the chat. Okay, perfect. What's the question? Um, so the question is, what about 
lot coverage restrictions due to storm water or water management. I know Rolling Hills has issues with that. Mm -hmm. you, you have to have a certain percentage of your lot under vegetation. I know there's some stuff in the Hollywood Riviera on the same. How mm -hmm. does that impact ADU? So there's two things that have to do with stormwater management. So there's the um, there are requirements for new stormwater runoff and how is that stormwater runoff managed on a house, right? Um, and so are we having to drain that into the storm drains? Are we having to capture that underground? Are we putting in rain barrels, right? Um, so there's there's that piece of it. When it comes to you know, lot coverage requirements or requirements to add additional vegetation. Um, those, it depends on the type of ADU being built. But basically, the state law has um, four classes of ADUs that can be built basically without additional zoning requirements. And um, for single family properties, that is, if you're building within an existing structure or if you're building a new detached unit up to 800 square feet. So, you know, that, that, for example, I know Rancho Palos Verdes has a restriction. Um, they have um, foliage requirements, right? They go out and they do a foliage analysis and tell you what, um, what the foliage requirements are going to be for, for when you want to do new development. Well, for, you know, we're, we're helping a client in RPV get an unpermitted garage conversion permitted. They had Long time ago, detached garage had been converted to like a pool house ADU, and then they had built a new attached garage. Well, they just want to get it permitted, and so we, you know, went through this process, and they wanted to do the fo the foliage analysis, right? Um, which is what they do for new development, rightly so. Um, but for ADUs, for the specific type of ADU we're doing, which is we're we're getting um, an existing unpermit, you know, existing space, a, a formerly a garage, uh, permitted as an ADU. Um, they can't require that as an additional requirement. Now, if you wanted to do something different, that's not one of those four specific classes, let's say you wanted to add an ADU to an existing property, right? In that, in that case, the city um, may require that. If that's part of their ADU ordinance for development, they actually may require that. So it depends on the type of ADU that you're, that you're wanting to build on the property. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. All right. Any other questions before we move on to um, before we move on to uh, how to handle your listings? No. Okay. All right. Then let's let's look at our listings and what are some things that we want to um, really really be paying attention to when we're when we're listing a property. Okay. Am I sharing my screen? Can you guys see what I'm seeing? Because once I click over, no, I we can't don't see your No, we're not seeing your You're screen. not seeing it. Okay, sorry. It's it's so funny because when I'm when I'm in my PowerPoint, I can no longer see you guys. I try to open it big and then I can no longer see what what you guys are all seeing. Okay. So here we go. Now can you see my screen? Sounds like yes. Yes, we can hear. Yes. Dream. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about listing a property with an ADU. What are some what are some things to consider when you are listing a property with an ADU, with an unpermitted ADU, or with ADU potential? What should we be paying attention to? Um, of course, we recommend getting an ADU report done in advance. This allows you to market and protect you from liability. Um, when you're putting it on the MLS, you know what, I didn't put this on here. When you're putting it on the MLS, there is actually a little known um, addendum that you can click, which is an ADU addendum. And I do recommend doing the ADU addendum. And the reason for that is because it allows properties with ADUs to be more searchable on the MLS. So of course it helps you to sell the property if someone's looking for an ADU. But the other thing that it does is it helps appraisers. So one of the biggest issues that we're having right now um, with ADUs is, is the appraisal industry is lagging really, really, really far behind where the market is right now with ADUs. So people see the value, the market sees the value, but our appraisers 
um, and our lenders are looking at historic data from back when there weren't very many ADUs. Um, and so we're, that's really the biggest issue you're going to run into in a transaction is with the appraisal. So you can help appraisers out when you list your property with an ADU by clicking the, the ADU addendum um, on the MLS. So make sure to do that. Get an ADU report done and you can put that in with your supplementals. And I'm just going to give you a little hint here. Usually when people are buying, Okay, so now we're putting our listing agent hat on. We know there's different strategies when you're representing the buyer than when you're representing the seller. So when you're representing the seller, right? If you provide people with information from a credible source, oftentimes it doesn't really matter if the information is beneficial or not. Having the information gives a person perceived value. Okay, so for example, um, there was a, this is unrelated to ADUs, but there was a study done related to um, people who put the energy efficiency of a home in their listings and how that affected prices. And what they found was that um, listings that put the energy efficiency and what the typical utility bills were actually sold for a higher price, even though they weren't necessarily more energy efficient than the other homes on the market. And so just by ha people having information, right, there's perceived value. If they're seeing the information, they perceive there to be value. So even if we do a report and there's challenges to this property of building an ADU, and that's in the report, the fact that overall the report says, yes, you can build an ADU on this property gives the, um, the, the buyer peace of mind. And so I that would just be what I would say is, is um, you know having that information and eliminating as many of the question marks and unknowns as possible for the buyer will help them to want to be able to proceed um, with the property and, and give them the confidence in wanting to put in an offer on the property for for what their perceived value is without without it'll it'll have them feeling like they're taking on less risk. So that's something that you can do for your property if you feel like it's a good candidate for an ADU. All right. The other thing that you should do when you're pricing, a lot of times people call me and they say, you know, how much value does an ADU add to a property? Well, it really depends on the area that you're in, right? So what you need to do is you need to look for local comps in the area, obviously, um, that have ADUs on them. So obviously you're looking at comparable homes, but then you almost have to do a separate little market analysis for properties that have ADUs. And you might have to go further back in time and you might have to go outside of your market area. But what you're looking for is not necessarily what was the price of that property, because you may find a property that has an ADU um, where the, the ADU is comparable, but the house is not comparable or the area is not comparable. But what you wanna look for you want to get as close to your area as you can and as close back in time as you can, but you might have to extend those parameters. But what you want to look for is how, how was the sales price of that house with the ADU compared to other comparable properties in that market? And that's what's going to give you an idea of how are ADUs affecting the market values for a specific market. Because they do have intrinsic values in some areas more so than others. So that is important to look at. All right. So, so that's what you want. That's really what you want to consider when you're pricing the, the property. I will tell you there, there seems to be pretty high demand. I mean, I'm not out there listing properties right now. I'm building ADUs, but there really seems by just the requests that we're getting for to do reports for people, there are a lot of buyers out there that really, really want an ADU or they want a property where they can build an ADU. So if you've got a property that has an ADU on it, whether the unit's permitted or unpermitted, um, you're probably going to have some, some good luck with getting that thing sold. All right. Um, again, if it's, if you have an unpermitted unit, feel free to call us out. We will do that report for you. We'll put the information in there for what the person will need to do to get it permitted. Again, it gives them that knowledge. It gives them that peace of mind of knowing um, that it, that this is doable, that this project is a good candidate for getting a, an ADU permitted. 
granted, it'll be up to them to figure out what that what the cost is going to be for that. Um, and you know, usually buyers tend to underestimate what the what the cost will be. So if you're listing the property with an unpermitted unit, that's it's probably to your benefit. Um, all right, so let's see. Preparing for the appraisal. Okay, you guys, this is so important. This is the most important thing you can do for your client um, to help them get top value for their property is adequately preparing for the appraisal because what's gonna happen is you are gonna be dealing with an appraiser who is likely not educated on how to appraise a property with an ADU. And you know, in the best case scenario, which is almost never, in the best case scenario, the appraisal value, the addition they put in for that ADU is above what it costs to build the ADU. In the worst case scenario, and I've seen this three times now, where an appraiser has given a zero value for a permitted ADU with a certificate of occupancy. And that was a poor appraisal. Undoubtedly, that was a poor appraisal, right? The appraiser did not do a good job on that appraiser appraisal, but it is it is very, very hard to get an appraisal overturned once it happens, right? If anyone's, if anyone's ever tried to go through this process, very, very hard to challenge an appraisal. So you want to, you really, really need to make sure you set the appraiser up for success. So let me walk you through what to do. So first of all, um, what I will tell you is there is a course that just was written um, in September of last year by one of the top appraisers in um, the state of California, Dennis DeSau. And it is, um, he, he wrote the curriculum for the Appraisal Institute. And the Appraisal Institute offers a lot of courses and a lot of certifications for appraisals, appraisers. Now, it's, it would be a very, very, very um, big uphill climb for us to be able to get any kind of a certification on ADUs and the time frame that we need for, to be effective, it, like it's just not, it's not gonna happen, I, I don't think. But they do have this course. It's not a certification, but it's a course. And we're working with the Appraisal Institute right now on your guys' behalf to, so that we can have a list of appraisers who have taken the course and adequately know how to appraise a property with an ADU because there were some changes in the guidelines and the lending guidelines and the appraising guidelines that went into effect last year um, that provide a pathway for appraising ADUs. It's just that most appraisers are not aware of it. So how do you empower yourself as a realtor? Let me walk you through what you can do. Um, and we're working behind the scenes on your behalf as well. You guys have been, I have to tell you, you guys have been our best source of referrals and we will do anything we, whatever you need, whatever you need our industry to do, whatever you need the appraisal industry to do, we're working on um, legislation with the Casita Coalition to, you know, enable people to build. So whatever it is that you need from us to help you um, with ADU properties, let us know. And we'll, we'll, we're working, you know, behind the scenes to make these things happen. But here's the big thing. Make sure that your that um, what I would recommend is make sure that you have the buyers work with a lender who has at least one qualified appraiser in their AMC who is qualified to value um, an appraisal or uh, to uh, home with an ADU. Now we know that we can't pick the appraiser. You can't pick the appraiser. The lender can't pick the appraiser, but what the lender can do and what you can do is make sure there is somebody on um, the, the AMC roster who has taken this course through the Appraisal Institute on how to value an ADU. Now the course has only been taught a couple times. And so what I'm gonna tell you is most AMCs do not have a qualified appraiser who's gonna be able to give you an honest appraisal for a property with an ADU. So what I am recommending, I do have a couple of lenders um, who are very ADU knowledgeable and they have made sure that they have an appraiser on their AMC who has taken this course, right? So um, I can, I can, you know, uh, make a recommendation or get your lender to, to get someone on their AMC to take this course. That would be my, my recommendation. Talk to your lender now so that they're ready by the time you get that listing with an ADU on it. Um, but I would very much make sure that you're able to have some have some controllability around who does the appraisal and making sure they're very qualified. 
to give you an honest appraiser appraisal. Okay, um, I see that we have one chat that's come up and it's probably related to appraisal. Let's see what it says. Oh, I can't, it's not letting me see my chats right now. All right, you might just have to chime in. Or, or once I get done with this screen, I can go back to the chat box. Or Crystal, are you able to see it? I am, I can read it to you. How, okay. much, does an ADU, how much does an ADU increase the property value? Is the square footage of an ADU added to the square footage of the home when listing it? Okay, those are two really, really good questions. So yes, the ADU will be added to the square footage of your listing, yes. Yeah, so when, you're, when you are listing, you will add an ADU. When you're listing though, if you have a primary house with an ADU, you will not list it as a duplex. That is a, that's that, because the lending guidelines will not allow that to be considered a duplex. And there was actually a realtor who called me last year who was in a, in a really big pickle because there was a property, there was an additional unit being built on a property and they had listed it as a duplex. She was under the, you know, she was under the understanding that this was going to be a single family property that was being converted to a duplex. And um, when they went to get the certificate of occupancy, it turns out it was an ADU. Well, now all of a sudden this changed the lending program that they could be in. They had to order a whole new appraisal. <laughs> it changed everything. And they were about a week away from closing and they had to redo all of this. So it is really important, you know, when you're representing your buyers, it's really, really important. And it's, and what makes it more challenging now is you might be putting an offer on something that you think is a duplex. Well, now you need to confirm it's a duplex because now there are a lot more properties that we're starting to see where they have an ADU, um, a, a single family plus an ADU and, the, and, it's, and it's valued differently. Um, similarly, if you have a duplex property and you add a, an ADU to it, it's not a triplex, it's a duplex plus an ADU. So probably we need to get some additional categories added to the MLS so that you guys can properly list the properties, you know, um, adequately because people are looking for these properties. They are looking for either the additional units or the properties with the, um, with the, the ADU on it. Crystal, did I, did I, there were a couple parts to that. Did I answer both parts of that question? Um, let me pull it up here. Okay. Um, it also asks, how much does an ADU increase the property value? How much does it increase the property value? This is the this is the golden question I get all the time, um, and and again, it's 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 market specific, and it really depends on the ADU itself, right? What quality standard was it built to, and how how private is it, and does it have parking, and what are the um, what are the demands in that area? What are the rental what is the rental market like in that area? So in terms of what the market wants to pay for an ADU, it really, really, really depends on the area you're in. And that's why I say it's, it's really good to try to find comparable, um, comparable properties or properties with ADUs as close to your property as possible. You may not find one, um, you know, really, really, you may not find one in your exact neighborhood, but as, as close as possible. That's what you're going to have to do. It's, it's really hard to say how much um, value it will add. I will tell you this, though. The market will attribute a higher value to that ADU than the appraiser typically will. And that's why it is so, 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 so important, <laughs> so important that you get a good appraisal, because otherwise you may have issues. If you have an appraisal contingency on the property, you may have an issue when you get to the appraisal, appraisal if you're not really taking these steps. OK, so very, very important. All right, now let's talk for a minute about how to prepare for the appraisal. And I don't want to confuse you with the, the items I'm about to tell you. I don't want to um, have you think that this is what, how they're going to appraise the property because it's not. But these are just helpful things to provide. In talking to Dennis, these are some of the things that he says to be ready with that can benefit you, even though it's not what the value will be based on. All right, so first of all, the first thing that you absolutely will want to do is be prepared with comps. You can have comps of the main property, but you also need to be able to show at least one property, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it, it might be back a little further than three months and it might be a little bit outside of the area, right? But you need to show a property with an ADU that's sold to show the marketability of ADUs, right? To show that it's something that's in demand in the market and to also show how that property compared to other 
comparable properties on the market. So obviously you wanna find a comparable property that sold for a lot more than other properties on the market, right? That didn't have an ADU. So you can say, here's what the market is saying an ADU should be valued at, okay? So that's, that's one thing. It might take a little bit of, of, of digging around to find that comp, but you wanna look for that comp, okay. And that's, and that's part of what they're, they're, the new way that they're appraising a property is they have to find a property with an ADU. It doesn't necessarily, the main house doesn't necessarily have to be a comparable size. And sometimes they're going a little outside of the geographical area or they're going a little further back in time, but they have to show the marketability. They have to show that this is something that's currently on the market and that people see a value. All right. The other thing is be ready with the build cost information. Now, you're not going to see this written up on the appraisal report, but what Dennis says is that it will oftentimes influence an appraiser. All right. It will oftentimes influence an appraiser. So you want to make sure that you have the build, that you have the build cost. So make sure that as your homeowner is, is um, building their AD, they're keeping all the receipts and invoices. We have all of that. We have a portal that we, I'll show you in just a minute, actually. We have a portal um, that our clients use to be able to, um, to be able to go in and, and track all of that information. So it's all together in one place. So it's not like the client loses their paper receipt. Oh shoot, what do we do now? No, we've got all of that in our database. So we can provide all of that to you when it comes time to sell the property. Um, and then also provide local rental comps. Now, they, they, the, the appraiser is not going to be able to value the property based on, on rental income, the way a multifamily property would be appraised, okay? That's, they don't appraise it that way. But Dennis has said, if you can provide local rental comps, it does show a demand in the market, right? It helps to, to demonstrate the value of this unit as something that could be rented out. We don't know that the buyer, maybe the buyer doesn't want to rent it out. They may want to have their adult child live there or something, but, but it at least is something, again, in the mind of that appraiser, it plants a seed of value. So they'll be looking for a way to inc include the value for this property. So those are some things you can do to help you. Now, let me ask you this, um, of the people on this call, how many people would be interested if we were to be able to provide a course, um, this course through the Appraisal Institute on valuing properties with ADUs. Is this something that people on this call would be interested in attending or inviting your lender to attend? Is there, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing. Yes. I'm hearing, I got one yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, we've got a couple yeses. All right, it's going to be an expensive course. So for me to sponsor this course, it's going to be a few thousand dollars. So I want to make if I if I provide it, I want to make sure that I'm offering good value. But I know that this is an area that, you know, realtors want to know how to price these homes and they want to know what's going to happen during the appraisal. They want to understand what is that appraisal process going to be. So um, that is something that we're looking at being able to provide for you guys. Um, because it is a, a question that we get asked a lot. And I would love to have you talk to the guy who wrote the curriculum for the state of California on this. Actually, the curriculum is nationwide. It's just the rest of the country hasn't caught up with their ADU laws yet. Um, all right, cool. Um, that is great. So what we will do, we will make sure that um, we have a um, we've, we've kept track of all the people that have said that yes, indeed, they want to have information from us um, related to ADUs. And we occasionally send information out. We let people know when we've got training classes and whatnot. Let me show you, if you want to receive that information, we have a special, um, we have a special realtors only. Let me just pull it up really quick. We have a special realtors only page and we're, we're we had, I had wanted to have some resources up there for you today. But um, one of our one of our um, team members was has been ill, so she has not been able to get that up for you. But let me just take you there, so you can see we're we're building this out because we really want you guys to have access to to resources 
you know, because you may not have a listing for six months and you're going to remember everything I told you. So we want you to have all of the this information readily at hand. So let me just show you. We've got a special page on our website. You're not going to find a link to it, right? It's you got to you got to be in the know. You got it's one that you have to be in the know, um, and it's our realtors only page. All right. So let me make sure I'm sharing my screen. All right. This is our realtor. This is our realtors only page. And again, we're 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 going to be populated. If you check back in within about a week, we'll have it populated with some clickable resources for you. We're going to put all of the 2020 legal updates. We're going to put the what to what to look for if you're um, have a buyer, what to look for in a property, um, and then you know what to consider for your appraisal appraisal. And then we're also going to be putting up the um, the aid, the technical assistance handbook for ADUs that came out from Department of Housing and Community Development. So these are all going to be up on here. But if you want for us to be in communication about things such as this course that we're going to be teaching um, with the Appraisal Institute, definitely make sure that you're on our mailing list. We don't send out much, to be honest. We're not sending out a lot. But if we have something pertinent specific to realtors, we want just an easy way to reach out to you. So we have this realtors only. It's basically at sidekick.homes slash realtors only. <laughs> so we're taking, we're taking care of you guys. Um, and if there's anything that you feel like would be a really good tool or resource, let us know. Um, because again, we do really want to support you. We know once you've got a property, you know, you're ready to list a property, things start moving really, really fast for you. And you just need to, to have access and, and information at hand. So we want to support you as much as we can with that. Um, so this is just our, you know, realtors only page. Um, the other thing that I will show you while I'm here, while I'm on the website, I'm just going to show you really quick our sidekick project portal. So this is for your clients that actually have a project underway with us. Um, just so you can see what this, um, what this looks like. Go. All right, I'm just going to walk you behind the scenes of a project so that you can just get an idea of this. Let me just pick a pick a project here. Let's pick this project. All right, so this um, this is what a client's dashboard looks like. So this is a project that we have underway in North Hills. These are our clients, Tony and Gloria. Um, this is the project for their ADU. And you can just see we've got, um, you know, we've got progress photos. I could open this up and show you all the progress photos. We're, we're getting ready to install the finishes right now for this project. But you can see this is just some most recent interior photos. There's like 268 photos in here, a lot of photos of this project. Um, but you can see what the contract price is. The change orders, they've actually gotten a credit. So their project is actually coming out less expensive than it started at the beginning. Uh, but we do pride ourselves on keeping our change orders um, really, really tight. Um, you know, we're, we're not a company that's gonna end up with 30 to 40% change orders. We're usually keeping them to about three to 4% of the budget. In this case, they're, they're credit ahead on their project. So they're doing great. Um, but we also have, you know, um, we're able to do our do our change orders through the system, make selections through the system. Um, they can see the construction schedule. You can also see that down here if we click on the schedule. So everyone's on the same page with what phase we're in and what work we still have left to do. Um, if there are any uh, change orders or photos, oftentimes you'll actually see those and they'll show up in the schedule. It's really great, especially, let's go back in January. It's really great, especially for photos to actually see photos that were taken during a certain phase of the project. So that ends up being really nice. Um, we'll go back to the main page. There's also files. So we keep all of our documents, photos, everything in one place. This is where I said, you know, a year from now, if the client wants to list their property, um, and you come to us as a listing agent say, hey, Florentine, our clients did a project with you. We're trying to get all of the invoices and total cost for that project so that we can include it, um, you know, and give that information to the appraiser. Uh, we've got it all kept in one place. So it's all really easy to find. Um, we also have a messaging center, which helps, helps, you know, a lot of times clients will make requests at the very beginning of a project and six months later, we have to remember what the communication was. So we keep all of that in one place. And of course, we're able to pay invoices online as well. So that's just our portal. Clients have been loving it. They love, you know, just knowing what's going on with their project. A lot of construction projects, people really complain that they don't receive good communication or um, the, you know, they, the, the prices were, went, you know, far beyond budget or the time schedule went a lot longer than they were anticipated. And we, we really stick pretty close to our upfront estimates for those things. 
Um, and then also we can see our weather forecast, which is helpful when we've had rain, we've had projects that we had to quick get the roof put on, or um, you know, we had to wait to, to pour concrete or wait to do paint because it was gonna be too damp. So um, a lot of times we're keeping an eye on the weather and we've got the weather here in our, in our little portal as well.